Good evening, everyone, uh, and thank you for um, welcome to today's talk, Ice and Awe in, of Antarctica. Uh, this is one of our signature talks in the Destinations and Discovery series sponsored by Cavalier Travels at the university's uh, Office of Engagement. Uh, my name is Kevin Connolly, and I'm the Senior Director of UVA's Alumni and Parent Travel Program, Cavalier Travels. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to highlight uh, several webinar logistics. Um, we are recording today's program, and we'll share a link to the recording um, as a follow-up email in case you would like to revisit today's conversation. Uh, we'd also, uh, we'll also post a link on the Cavalier Travels webpage. Um, at any time during the webinar, you may use the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen to submit questions for our speaker. We will get to as many as possible with the time that we have. Um, if you pre-submitted a question when you registered, we have it in our list of questions. And so you do not need to submit it again uh, today. Uh, for those of you who know me, the reason I have this eye patch on is because I had a detached retina and I had to have it fixed. And hopefully in a couple of weeks, I'll be able to see out of that eye again. So anyway, um, let's see. Now I'm in, pleased to introduce our this evening's speaker, Lauren Simpkins. Uh, Lauren has been on the faculty of the Department of uh, Environmental Sciences at UVA since 2018, and she has an expertise in polar and cold regions of our planet. She teaches courses in polar environments, glaciology, and geoscience. Uh, her research focuses on understanding the controls on glacier and ice sheet change using sediment and landform records from Antarctica and elsewhere globally. She has been on two different research cruises to Antarctica, both of which were three months long. She has published over 30 articles in peer-reviewed journals, including with Nature and Science Family Journals, has given many talks at universities and national and international conferences. Uh, she has been awarded the Mead Honored Faculty in 2020 for outstanding educational engagement with undergraduate students here at UVA. Um, and she has been nominated to the uh, National Academy of Sciences Engineering Medicine Polar Research Board. She has been elected to the Executive Committee of the American Geophysical Union uh, Cryospheric Sciences Section. She released, recently received an Excellence in Teaching Award from the Jefferson Scholars Foundation at UVA. She is a principal investigator within the International Thwaites, I'll let her pronounce that, it might be Thwaites, uh, Glacier Collaboration to better understand all facets of this glacier and is one of the leading Antarctic contributors to the global sea rise, or several, glo, global sea level rise today. Uh, Lauren is with us today to discuss Antarctica and some of the fascinating details about the geological record and the seafloor. Lauren, welcome, and I will turn it over to you and join you later in the program when we transition to questions from our audience. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Being a, a webinar, it's hard to tell how many people are here. It could be one of you or a hundred, I don't know. Um, but thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, so today we're going to talk about one of my favorite places. Um, if you've seen a generic map, of our planet, often this place is excluded from that map. Um, and it's certainly not a place that I thought about growing up in Oklahoma. Uh, so this, this place that, right, is, is um, often off of our maps and out of our minds, right, is this really strikingly beautiful um, and relatively pristine place on our planet. Um, so the image that you see here in the background, this is a satellite image of one of the ice shelves. Um, the little black patches that you see, some of those are mountains. And then um, towards the middle, that's actually the ocean. And so what I think about a lot is this intersection between ice and ocean and how the geologic record records that. But first, before we get um, into uh, the kind of nitty gritty or fun things about Antarctica um, and my research, let's just focus a little bit on frozen parts of our planet. Um, so when we talk about Antarctica, um, it is a land mass that's covered by an ice sheet. And an ice sheet is essentially an amalgamation of many, many, many different glaciers. Um, that have grown over periods of thousands, in, in the case of Antarctica, millions of years. The Antarctic ice sheet has been around in some form um, since about 30, 30 or so million years ago. Um, so we're talking about this huge body of ice that's sitting on land um, and interacting with not only the atmosphere, but also the ocean that surrounds um, the continent. Um, and believe it or not, um, uh, um, the Antarctic ice sheet um, has a huge impact on 
the energy budget within our atmosphere. Right? If you've ever been skiing and forgot your sunglasses, you know how reflective um, a snow surface is. And that's the same thing with, with an ice sheet or a glacier, right? So there's a lot of energy, um, uh, solar energy that bounces off of glacial ice. Um, and uh, that can uh, reduce the amount of warming that happens within our atmosphere. That's just one of the, the implications of having ice on our planet. Um, and then there are other parts of the cryosphere that you may or may not be familiar with. Um, permafrost, right, frozen ground, and um, that is a big part of the cryosphere, especially in the Arctic. Um, and then we have ice that floats around in the ocean. If you've ever been on a, on a cruise um, around Antarctica, um, you will know that there's sea ice, there are icebergs that are floating around or have seen um, really beautiful pictures from Antarctica. Um, so we have a lot of different types of ice on our planet. And the one that I focus on, right, are these glaciers and ice sheets, and in particular in Antarctica. And so this is just another perspective of the different parts of uh, frozen parts of our, our planet. We call that the cryosphere. Um, so we, we uh, on the left, we can see the Arctic. And then on the, the right, we have Antarctica, the landmass covered by this ginormous ice sheet that's in some places four kilometers thick. Um, and then this ring of, of floating sea ice in the ocean. Um, this cryosphere, on a global scale, right, it covers about 11% of our planet. Um, and when we think about Antarctica, um, about 95% of the continent is covered by ice. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, this ice has been around for, um, for over 30 million years. Um, there are huge implications, as, as I mentioned earlier, for how ice on our planet, and in particular ice sheets, impact warming in our atmosphere, um, but also impact uh, global ocean circulation and heat transport. So if, um, if we take measurements from the bottom of the ocean, say offshore of, um, in the deep ocean offshore of New Jersey, for example, the water that you'll find at the very bottom of the ocean is sourced from Antarctica. And so even though right, we, Antarctica is so far away in our minds, sometimes off of our maps, um, there is this huge global implication of what's happening um, in Antarctica that doesn't stay in Antarctica. And because of that, right, we really need to understand um, changes that are happening today, but also changes that have happened in the past on longer time scales, like decades, centuries, millennia, millions of years, um, to have this longer term context for changes that are happening in Antarctica. And as you all probably know, right, there are interesting species that live in Antarctica. Um, uh, there are, um, there's a group of species called ice obligate, um, and those are species that are very well adapted to living in Antarctica. Um, so those are like Adelian emperor penguins, Waddell seals. I have a picture of Waddell, Waddell seals at the, the end of my talk. Um, and then Southern minke, which is a type of, a type of whale. Um, that is often seen on cruises around Antarctica. So um, I mentioned that there are changes happening in Antarctica today. Um, one of the sort of hot spots of changes um, is in this little, this little nook right here in the Amundsen Sea. Um, Pine Island Glacier is labeled, um, and we can see that in this kind of blow up image here with Pine Island Glacier and Thwaites Glacier. And today, these two glaciers are the ones that are contributing the most to sea level from the Antarctic ice sheet. Um, Kevin mentioned that I'm part of um, a international collaboration to better understand Thwaites Glacier. Um, and I, I'm actually at a lab right now. You can see behind me a big warehouse um, where uh, thousands of sediment cores have been collected from the Antarctic seafloor, just, just um, seaward of glaciers like Thwaites Glacier and Pine Island Glacier. So I'm here right now with my colleagues um, from uh, research institutions like the British Antarctic Survey and other universities um, in the US and the UK. 
Um, so these two glaciers are really important um, because we know they are contributing a measurable amount to global sea level rise. Um, and what we see here are changes in the velocity of these two glaciers. Um, and when we think about um, glaciers and ice sheets, we have to remember that they're flowing across the landscape, um, similar to rivers, right, but just slower. Um, you can see that this this, um, these color bars, this is in kilometers per year, um, with the red indicating speed up in, in that flow across the landscape. And as these, these glaciers are um, essentially scraping across the land, right, they have these interesting interactions um, uh, with the geology beneath. Right? So sediments, broken pieces of rocks are moved across the landscape and into the ocean. Um, and we can use those broken pieces of rocks and sediments to better understand how glaciers have changed in the past, how the ocean has changed in, in the past, how quickly and why. Um, so we can also observe right, the, the modern Antarctic ice sheet as it exists today via satellites and even um, by sending people out onto the the, um, the ice to make measurements. But that really um, uh, is giving us a short window of time for thinking about changes in the Antarctic ice sheet. And so one nice thing about geology and the geologic record is that um, if we know how to read these landscapes, including the seafloor um, that was once covered by, by, um, by the ice sheet or is being influenced in some way by the ice sheet, this gives us perspectives that go um, far back in time beyond the period of direct human um, and instrumental observation. So we can think about right, these longer time scales um, of centuries, thousands of years, millions of years, and in some cases, billions of years, not necessarily in Antarctica, but this, um, this uh, rock that you see here, this was essentially scratched by glaciers almost 3 billion years ago, right? So there's a lot we can learn from the geologic record. Um, and I have chosen to use those sort of geologic tools to better understand um, uh, ice sheet change on our planet. There's one, um, particular uh, point in time that I, I think about, and this is about 20,000 years ago. Um, this is showing uh, the, the size or the extent of ice sheets and glaciers about 20,000 years ago. Um, so we can see that the Antarctic ice sheet was larger than it is today. The Greenland ice sheet is larger or was larger than it is today. Um, the vast majority of Canada was covered by an ice sheet. I always like to say my parents named me after the Laurentide ice sheet, but they didn't. Um, it's just a coincidence. Um, large parts of uh, Scandinavia, parts of Russia were covered by, by really thick ice sheets. Um, and so we can go to these locations that used to be covered by glacial ice. Um, and we can go to these locations um, uh, that are close to the margins of contemporary or modern um, glaciers like in Antarctica to better understand glacial change on a variety of different time scales and think about, well, why are these glaciers and ice sheets changing in the first place? And so one way we do that is by collecting sediment cores. Um, so this is showing you an image of um, uh, a sediment core that's coming up from the seafloor. So these sediment core, this exact sediment core that you see in this picture is in this cooler behind me. That, oh, I don't know what you all see, but there's a door that goes into a, a warehouse size cooler where all of these sediment cores are stored. And Why don't so, you tell us where you are, Lauren? Oh yeah, so I'm, I'm at Oregon State University. Um, at the, uh, the Antarctic core collection. So um, uh, taxpayer dollars and the, through the National Science Foundation um, have paid for the archiving of this precious material that comes back from Antarctica, um, from the seafloor. Um, and so um, there is this place at Oregon State where researchers across the, across the globe can come here and study these Antarctic sediment cores. And I probably still have dirt under my fingernails from, from working on these sediment cores. As soon as I'm done with this, I'm gonna go back and, and work on these sediment cores to think about how um, Thwaites Glacier has changed over the past um, hundreds to thousands of years. 
Um, so these sediments that end up getting deposited on the seafloor um, are produced by, by the ice essentially grinding the landscape um, on which it sits and is flowing across. Um, and the size, the shape, the competi competi uh, not competition, composition of those sediments can tell us a lot about the, not only the environment in which um, the sediments were deposited, um, it can tell us about ice, ocean, atmosphere interactions um, and processes that are taking place in the ocean, but also on the glacier side as well. This is, um, this is an image of one of the sediment cores that I looked at here at Oregon State yesterday. Um, and uh, what we do is we describe them, we, we can do analyses here as well, um, but mostly what I've been doing is um, taking smaller samples from these sediment cores to send back to the University of Virginia where um, uh, myself and students can work on those uh, for years to come. We can also look at the shape of the seafloor, right? So in places around Antarctica that used to be covered by the Antarctic ice sheet, the seafloor that used to be covered by the Antarctic ice sheet and the ice sheet has since retreated to its current position, um, there are all of these landforms that are preserved on the seafloor that, that indicate how fast the ice was flowing um, and how quickly it was retreating. So here are just some examples of these different types of landforms that are observed on the seafloor. Um, the colors are showing water depth or bathymetry. You can see they're negative, right? So these are below the sea surface. Um, and we can see different styles of these features that tell us something about how ice is flowing. Um, and in this case, these, these types of landforms are indicating retreat of the margin of glaciers and parts of ice sheets across the seafloor to their inland locations. And so we can learn a lot, especially by coupling um, what we can gather from sediment cores with all of um, these landform analyses. Um, and so when we think about uh, uh, where retreat is happening, especially for glaciers and ice sheets that are sitting on the seafloor, right in the ocean itself, um, uh, we're really thinking about this this point right here. And if you can imagine, right, if this, um, this ice body is hundreds of meters thick, it's very hard to access and observe um, this point where uh, ice goes from in contact to the seafloor to floating, essentially. Um, and so using these geologic records is really critical. Um, and another uh, really important point is that the sea level contribution, say you're a particle of ice, the sea level contribution happens as ice goes from being right here in contact with the ground to, um, to then floating in the ocean. Um, and so this point right here is really um, important for thinking about um, how ice sheets contribute to sea level. Um, so the ship that, that we use here in the United States to collect all of these sediment cores um, that are behind me um, is the research vessel Icebreaker, the Nathaniel B. Palmer, or the Palmer for short, and it's a really beautiful ship. Um, here it is uh, in, um, in the Thwaites Glacier area. Um, and when we're on these ships, we uh, work 24-7. Um, as Kevin said, for up to three months. And so it's an exhausting experience. It's also exhilarating. It's a great learning opportunity for students. Um, and we work in day shifts and night shifts. Um, we also, one of the questions that I saw is when is the best time to go to Antarctica? The best time to go is in, um, in our winter, which is the austral summer. Um, so we usually go on these research cruises um, in, in January and stay until the end of March. Um, this is just showing, showing some of the sort of operations on the ship. Um, we have sediment cores. Uh, we do all sorts of um, uh, physical studies of the seafloor, seafloor mapping that I mentioned. Um, and we also study the ocean um, uh, to better understand changes that are happening today, but also in the past. And specifically for Thwaites Glacier, 
um, in what we're doing here right now at Oregon State, um, looking at these sediment cores, is trying to get a better understanding of, um, well, what are the changes that are happening? Um, how quickly are they happening? How quickly is the ocean, the bottom of the ocean warming? The, is, is the ice shelf um, decaying or is it stable? Um, how, how quickly is the glacier retreating? Um, and how quickly has that happened in the past to give us some, some um, And so these sediment cores can reveal a lot of information um, about uh, um, ocean and glacier changes and atmosphere changes. Um, some of these people in the pictures that you see here are here with me at Oregon State. Some of my colleagues from the British Antarctic Survey, one of um, my students, Santiago, he's right here. He's um, here at the, the core repository right now. Um, and uh, this is just showing some uh, probably unidentified species of worm that we brought up from the seafloor. On these research cruises, right, it is a lot of work, but there is some wind down time, right? Snowball fights, um, ping pong, we have cornhole tournaments as the ship is, is moving and rocking, um, and then the, the daily crossword puzzle. Um, so I hope this gives you some idea of what's going on at EVA. Um, uh, and just some, um, some uh, interesting tidbits about about Antarctica and, and how it impacts um, our planet at, at a global scale. Um, I think Kevin is going to take over on the question side, if you wanna pop up here. Um, but I just wanted to leave my, my email. Um, you can find out more about this research at my research group's um, uh, website. Um, and Kevin will... Um, there is a group that will be... Uh, uh, going to Antarctica and you can join that trip. Um, I just put a little screenshot, but I think the link is also going to go out into the chat. Hmm. Lauren, thank you so much for sharing your insight on today's topic. And um, that's great that you're there in Oregon State at the Oklahoma State in the uh, core repository. That is amazing. I didn't realize that's where you were going to be uh, coming to us from. So that's, but it makes sense, I guess, since you're on uh, break right now. Um, I learned a lot. I'm sure hope our guests did as well. Um, Let's see. I guess that'll be the, what we have for the questions, but um, we have a pre-submitted number of questions, and I'll go through a few of those, and then if anybody submits them, Beverly or my colleague will let me see them. Lauren, were there any of the particular questions that you wanted to answer in particular? Or, I, Kevin, I would love to answer the ones that you want me to answer. <laughs> Which ones are right. you interested in? <laughs> All right. Well, that's good. I have a few of them. Um, one of the questions that came in was, what activities does the National Science Foundation have ongoing in Antarctica? And how is that information being used? Ooh, that's that's a great question. So um, every year there are dozens of projects, maybe more than that, um, where there are um, researchers going to Antarctica and funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, those that type of research can be done. Um, it can be done on land, right, at research stations. Um, there are two. US funded research stations. There's one in the Antarctic Peninsula and there's one um, in the Ross Sea at McMurdo Station, which is the largest research station in Antarctica. It's like a mini, a mini town um, with a fire department and all. Um, so um, now I'm forgetting the question because I'm rambling on. Can you please remind me, Kevin? <laughs> so it's about the National Science Foundation and basically how yes, that information yes. is being used yeah. if it's being yeah. used. Yeah, so there are year-round operations that can happen at these research stations. Um, and then on a sort of seasonal basis, um, people like me or um, my students or colleagues will go out on research cruises when there's less sea ice in the austral summer. Um, there are helicopter operations to send people out into what we call the deep field. Um, and uh, there are a lot of actually ecologists or biologists who work in Antarctica on, especially on the ocean or the coastal side. Um, but then there's all sorts of um, uh, uh, research happening on physics, um, on thinking about the universe um, and our solar system, which you can observe it really well from Antarctica um, and finding things like meteorites on the, on the surface of the ice sheet. So um, any sort of 
of scientific research you can imagine is happening and is funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, the National Science Foundation also funds um, artists to go to Antarctica and work on, on um, projects there. Interesting. Well, we had a question come into the chat, which looks very interesting by somebody named Papa John. He says, do the different countries share the basis and the data that you're getting on the research? That's a great question. Um, so yes, um, there are a lot of international collaborations um, where you know folks from from the United States can can work at like a, a German or South Korean research station, um, and so uh, uh, there is a lot of um, a lot of collaboration that has to happen to work in this very remote place, mm -hmm. um, and that's always been the case. Um, in, in Antarctica. The data um, across national bounds um, is most, most often shared. Um, the difficult thing is translating that data, um, not only the language that it's, that it's sort of housed in, um, but the format of that data can be tricky. But then, then right, we can build these international collaborations where we can um, where we can really make use of other data that's that's been collected and that can be published online or stored at a place like um, like the Antarctic Core Collection here behind me. Hmm. Okay, um, Dr. Jim Dunnington and Lisa Dunnington have a question. Uh, they're from Lexington, Kentucky, whom I know they travel with us actually in the past many times. Uh, what is the greatest depth of sampling that can occur below the surface of the ice? Um, that's a great question. Um, so there have been sediment cores collected beneath the Antarctic ice sheet. Um, so drilling a hot water hole through, through the ice sheet um, and that can go hundreds of meters beneath the ice. We also have ice cores um, that are extremely long um, on the order of 2,000 to 3,000 meters long in Antarctica. And so we can we can get all the way down to to the base of the ice sheet, um, depending on what the research objectives are, and depending on the logistics um, of the equipment that's needed. Hmm. Here's a good one from an anonymous attendee: Is it safe to eat the snow from Antarctica? <laughs> I have. <laughs> you have to, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, sometimes. Uh, um, uh, if you are doing like coastal coastal work, right? Um, like I did for my dissertation, I worked on beaches in Antarctica. Um, there are beaches, not very many of them in mm -hmm. Antarctica, and they record sea level. But right, like if we needed ice or if we needed if we needed water, um, we could melt the snow and the ice and and, and eat it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah. Here's another one from Jennifer Blank. Uh, it says, is there a way to visit, and I have an answer to this too, but I'll wait and let you answer first. <laughs> is there a way to visit Antarctica outside of a research expedition and be environmentally responsible tourist? And mm. or does all non-research tourism affect and or hurt Antarctica? Yeah, so most, most of the people who actually contact the continent of Antarctica are researchers. There are specific locations, especially in the Antarctic Peninsula where um, tourists can visit. Um, but uh, because most of the people who go to Antarctica are, are researchers or people who support the research, um, uh, they're as researchers, we have to think how how can we be how can we be responsible in this pristine environment, right? Like me, I'm I'm on an, um, or send people on a research vessel, right? That's using that's using a lot of fuel, um, that's um, adding you know bits of pollution to to the ocean, and so not only on the tourism side do we have to think about this, but we do on the research side as well. But there are um, uh, tourist cruises to Antarctica that really put a lot of thought into um, making um, making the experience as sustainable and environmentally friendly as possible. Yeah, so I'd like to also add my two cents worth that our trip to Antarctica this uh, winter in November and December is with Lindblad Expeditions and National Geographic um, and the National Geographic Explorer, and they were the first company to be taking people to Antarctica. Uh, 40 years ago plus, and they are extremely um, 
environmentally conscious, uh, you know, leave, take nothing and leave nothing, of course, but, um, you know, the ships are very, and uh, my colleague put in the link to our trip uh, to Antarctica that Lauren will be joining us on and being our lead faculty member, uh, along with the National Geographic, um, which is the term I'm looking for, not you know, environmental scientists, basically. Um, and, it, and there is a link on that, on our link that talks about the ship and how environmentally conscious it is. Um, Another question that came in says, I live on the Florida coast and we read of accelerating melting of large ice sheets. Any comments on your hypothesis on accelerated melting and impact to sea levels? Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering if you've read one of my one of my papers. One of my colleagues is in Florida and just published a paper on um, uh, much faster retreat than we thought was possible. Um, so Right now, right, we have instrumental observations like satellite observations that span at best back to the early 1980s. So we're working with a pretty, um, pretty limited amount of time to observe global changes in glaciers and ice sheets, um, and in particular in Antarctica. Um, so, right, we know that changes are happening. We can kind of we can track over over a. a span of multiple decades um, uh, if like rates of ice flow into the ocean and thus sea level contributions have increased um, for various parts of the Antarctic ice sheet. Um, but we really have to rely on the geologic record if we want to go beyond right um, these several decades that we have instrumental observations. Um, so I think that it really takes um, not only international collaboration, right, to logistically get to Antarctica and try to address some of these questions about, um, you know, how much is sea level going to change in the future from, from glaciers and ice sheets, um, and, you know, why is this happening, where should we, where should we really target to, to understand these changes, like Thwaites Glacier, um, but it really takes um, going up across disciplinary bounds as well to think about the repercussions of, of changes, to think about um, natural variability in, in the cryosphere versus anthropogenically forced variability. Um, so I do think that um, we are getting better at putting these kind of these realistic bounds for, um, for changes that might happen in the future, right? Um, I think that we have we have a long way to go. Okay, let's see. Here's one of the trips that, uh, questions that came in pre pre uh, lecture, which I found very interesting. Since you've uh, traveled to Antarctica before, what are the three main things you wish you knew before going that you know now, and share and recommend with others? Um, the the top one that um, that comes to mind is the value of good socks. <laughs> You need to have good socks if you're going to Antarctica. <laughs> um, so nice thick wool socks and maybe even two or three pairs on your feet at the same time. Um, my dissertation work was was on these beaches in Antarctica um, where we camped for, for several days at a time um, and socks were very valuable. I think that if you have the opportunity to go to Antarctica, um, there's really a responsibility uh, to take pictures of that place that most people will not get to um, and share them with people. So if there's a way that you, you know, if you're not familiar with, with um, photography, I think like, you know, taking a photography lesson before it would be really, really valuable. Um, you know, me being, being an educator at the University of Virginia and talking about a subject that a lot of students haven't thought about, right, these icy parts of our planet, I can see um, how excited they are by seeing pictures from icy parts of our planet and learning about them, even though they might not ever, ever go. Um, and so I think, I think photography is, is really um, an important skill to go. Um, the third one, um, if you do go to Antarctica, um, it is not a place that you, it's, you can't equate it to any place that you've ever been. Um, and I think just being prepared for the shock and the awe, right, in the title of this, this um, webinar, the awe of, um, of this 
beautiful, pristine place where there aren't, you know, there aren't human structures kind of speckled across the horizon. So the amount of the your sense of scale is so is so um, thrown off because there's nothing for scale that your brain can kind of piece together how far away something is, how how tall a mountain is, how thick the ice is. Um, so I think just being prepared to have a very different experience in Antarctica than you have on on any other trip that you've been on. Fantastic. I would like to point out that on our trip in December, we'll also have a professional photographer on board who will give lessons. And the National Geographic Explorer has a photo uh, gear locker, basically, where you can borrow um, uh, photography gear. And I will say that Dr. Dunnington has a fantastic camera that I mean, he'd be happy to show you some of his pictures <laughs> on the way. That's awesome. That's see, awesome. how are we doing on time? What do we say? Yeah, we have some time, don't we? Um, a question that came in also, through the q a it was is it a feasible responsible way to help the ice sheets rejuvenate themselves yeah so this is a really tricky question um right we as humans we engineer the environment so much right we nourish beaches when there isn't enough sand for us to lay our bodies on <laughs> um, we we build up swamps so that we can build on them and so i think it is logical to think um, it is logical to think about how we can engineer um, glaciers and ice sheets so that they become more stable. It's in the logistics of, of carrying out those potential projects um, that become challenging, right? So Antarctica is um, the biggest, or the Antarctic ice sheet is the biggest ice sheet on our planet. Um, it is the largest reservoir of fresh water that could potentially go into the ocean and contribute to sea level. Um, so if we think about engineering projects, geoengineering projects in Antarctica, in this very, very remote place, um, it becomes super tricky. But there are ideas out there, and I'm happy to, um, if you want to send me an email, I can point you to some, um, to some sources that talk about these potential ideas. Um, one is building a wall on the sea floor in front of glaciers that are changing really fast um, to prevent warm ocean water from getting into contact with the ice and melting the ice and causing it to flow faster. Uh, there are other ideas um, similar to some like uh, glaciers like in the Alps where they blow, um, blow snow, right? So one idea is to use ocean water um, and freeze that and essentially precipitate that onto these vulnerable glaciers in Antarctica. There are a lot of logistical challenges with that and um, thinking about the difference in the, the chemistry between seawater versus fresh snow can have some implications. Um, but there are some there are some interesting ideas and it's fun to talk about them. Um, it's fun to think about um, if they would actually work. And then it gets, um, I think it gets disappointing when you really think about the logistics of carrying out these projects in very remote places. Fantastic. Well, um, let's see, there are a few more. Um, I guess we're getting close to winding down, but um, let's see if, Lauren, are there any particular things that you're especially looking forward to on this trip in uh, December or November? Or <laughs> November and December? <laughs> Well, I, I've been to Antarctica twice, and I can tell you I am so looking forward to this trip. I, I think that um, I, would, I would jump at any opportunity to go to Antarctica. I think it's a good place to um, kind of reset your perspective. Um, I think we are... Um, we live in, you know, fast-paced societies. We see all these human structures all the time, um, and uh, it's good to see a pristine place that is um, very minimally impacted by by people, at least, you know, on the surface. Right? We can talk about plastic um, contamination. We can talk about changes in ice sheets and sea level contributions, but um, when you look at this place, it it does look pristine. Um, I think it's just a good place to kind of reset yourself um, and to be inspired by the natural environment in ways that other locations can't. 
can't provide. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Well, this is, uh, you know, this has been a great talk. Thank you so much. And we look forward to traveling with you uh, in the fall. If anybody's interested, I think there's a link in the, um, the Q&A where you can learn more about the trip. Um, and I feel free to email me or Lauren uh, if you have any short questions. How long are you in Oklahoma, Lauren? Um, in Oregon. So I actually went oh, to Oregon. Oklahoma. I'm sorry. I, went I, to Oklahoma. Oklahoma. I went to Oklahoma State for my undergrad. I'm from sorry. Oklahoma. Yeah. So I always mix them up too. They're the same colors as well. Um, I am here until uh, Friday, and then I come oh, back okay. to Jacksonville. Fabulous. How often do you get to go there and study ice cores? Um, I typically come once a year, although mm -hmm. I have a new NSF project, um, and mm -hmm. we'll probably be coming twice a year for the next four years. Oh, yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming and joining us, and thank you again, Lauren, so much for your expertise. This is you know, very exciting for us to have you basically at UVA and also to join us uh, this this winter. So thank you for agreeing to do that and to have this talk.